When we walk into a museum, we might see some artworks with a clear story or a clear emotion. However, we may also see art that raises more questions than answers. Why paint about farmers? Why is this artwork about rocks and mirrors? What is this pregnant white man? This is where having art history knowledge can be very useful. It provides us with a structure when analyzing any artwork. If you're wondering why this artwork is about farmers, its date can help us map it to the realism movement, an art movement in the 1850s that wanted to highlight the working class and the poor. Is this artwork made of rocks? Its date and artist's name can help us map them to land art, where artists are experimenting with materials that go against the accepted definition of art. What about the sculpture? Well, let's leave that till the end of the video. So, when we analyze art, having art history knowledge is very useful, but learning it can be very overwhelming. You open books about the evolution of art, and they're always filled with so many movements and an alarming number of artworks. Where do we even begin? Here's how I do it. A simple mental map of Western art history. It is a set of connections and segments between art movements and artworks to help me remember the broad strokes of art throughout history. It helps me sort and curate new information in my brain as I learn. I slowly build my mental map over the years by adding more information, making adjustments to my current understanding, and adding non-Western art movements as well. It's a great system to learn. While this timeline is not meant to be prescriptive, it has been very helpful to many art students who are starting their art journey. We hope that you will find it helpful too. Let's start by dividing the entire Western art history into three segments. Pre-modern art. Before 1848, you'll see lots of figurative artworks here, where the subject matter is recognizable, such as people and objects. Modern art, 1848 to 1945, a lot of abstract artworks here, where the focus is on aesthetics, such as colors, shapes, and lines. After modern art, after 1945, a lot of exploration of new art forms that aren't just paintings and sculptures. There's video, dead animals, performances, the list goes on. When you think of the Mona Lisa, David, Van Gogh's Starry Starry Night, Picasso's fragmented artwork, the blood clawing machine, or even that viral banana on a wall, they all have their place on this map. There are also two anchor years in this map, 1848, the rise of European nationalism and the start of the first modern art movement, realism, and 1945, the end of World War II. These two signposts were chosen to be approximate markers so that we can better orientate ourselves in the vast art timeline. Let's take a closer look at each phase, starting with the first segment, before modern art. This segment covers a lot of artworks for more than 25,000 years. There are courses and degrees to cover them. So what we're going to do is to learn the general connections between the different major art styles so that we can better internalize the chronology and the broad strokes of each style. This segment begins with prehistoric art, known for their figurative artworks. Figurative art attempts to showcase human figures without making them look realistic. If you draw a stick figure, that's figurative art. Art historians say that these are mostly made for spiritual purposes. Hence, the artworks you see here do not have to look realistic or perfect. As long as the user understands what the visual or object is for, that's good enough for them. The desire to make figurative art continues throughout this segment of art history. But as human civilization becomes more complex, there is a stronger desire for realism, as can be seen in the next three major art styles, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman art. Let's compare how each style portrays a standing figure. The Egyptian pharaoh stands in an upright posture, a stiff pose. His eyes stare directly in front of him, lifeless, no facial expression. From the front, his features are symmetrical and geometric. Both his feet are placed on the ground. There is an attempt to show that he is walking, but with those straight legs, he looks very unnatural, like a robot. These characteristics reflect the Egyptians' desire to emphasize on communicating an idea rather than aiming for realism. The pharaoh is strong, powerful, and striding proudly. Just like other sculptures and paintings, Egyptians care for order and clarity in ideas. This also explains the use of symbols. If it looks like an eye, it's an eye. Even if eyes don't look like that from the side, if you can tell it's an eye, that's good enough. In contrast, the Greek athlete stands in a different way. Unlike the Egyptian pharaoh who stands on both legs, he stands on one, all of his weight on it, while the other leg is lifted and bent at the knee. This contrapposto pose gives the figure a more naturalistic representation, as this is how we typically stand in real life. His head is tilted to his right, 
as if something has caught his attention. His eyes look into the distance, his face a calm demeanor. His perfectly chiseled and symmetrical body exudes youthfulness and athleticism. These characteristics reflect similar ideals as the Egyptian, balance and order. But it also has something that the Egyptians don't have, a flair of naturalism, elegance and idealism. This desire to achieve a balance of beauty, harmony and accuracy in proportions stems from the desire to celebrate the Greeks' triumph over the Persians, to reflect their increasing national and civic pride, and to show how they're almost on equal footing with their perfect Greek gods. Finally, the Roman Emperor. While he adopts the contrapposto pose, he isn't as timeless as the Greek sculpture. His right arm is raised above his shoulder, his left arm draped with cloth, which starts from his left shoulder, like a cape. His head is tilted to his left, and slightly upwards, lips are pursed, his eyes looking into the far distance, as though he is addressing a crowd. Clearly, this is an emperor addressing his people, showing his might, prestige, and power. His torso isn't as ideal as the Greek figure. It's not slender. There's more meat, like a dad bod, and there are wrinkles on his forehead, showing signs of aging. These characteristics reflect the Romans' desire for verism, where the imperfections of the human body are made worse to highlight that they are old. The more imperfections that they portray, the more realistic and believable these sculptures become. This style shows a clear priority for wisdom, power, and authority that typically comes with age and experience, thus making it all the more attractive when art is used for propaganda. Comparing these three standing figures can help us see the progression of art styles over time, a growth towards realism. We can also see this progression towards realism in the next three art styles, medieval, renaissance, and baroque. These three periods are known for their religious subject matter. Art is used to spread the word of Christianity, and this gives us an opportunity to see how the styles change over time. Before we continue, are you wondering why there is a drop in skills from here to here? Well, there's war, so a lot of artists died. And there's an iconoclast period, where rulers forbid any images of God or religion, so no one was making art about Christianity. If no one passes down the knowledge to the younger generation, artists have to learn how to paint or sculpt from scratch. So, just like prehistoric and Egyptian art, medieval art is figurative, flat, and more symbolic in nature. There is less emphasis on attempting to create something realistic, because the purpose of art is to communicate religious narratives in the clearest way possible. It's okay if babies look like old people, and the size of a person is determined not by how huge they really are in real life but by their status. Mother Mary and Jesus have to be bigger than the angels or the priests, because they're the most important. But not all skills from the past are lost. Artists still made attempts to depict some form of realism, such as the use of gradient tones on the faces to depict light and shadow, thus suggesting volume, and the use of diagonal lines for the throne, to suggest that it exists in a three-dimensional space. If we compare medieval art with Egyptian art, where two powerful beings are seated on a throne, medieval art is looking more realistic. In contrast, Mary and Christ in this Renaissance painting are treated in a much more realistic, sweet, idealized, and relatable manner. Their fair skin exudes innocence, and they're looking into the distance, just like the Greek sculptures, as though they are in their own world, unaware of the viewer. The baby is looking more childlike, and is a lot more connected with the mother, such as the arms wrapped around her collarbone, and his left toes gently placed on his mother's hand. While the medieval Christ is seated upright, suggesting some level of self-importance, Renaissance Christ shows more dependence on his mother, further reinforcing his innocence and sweetness and making him more relatable to the audience. Together with the use of chiaroscuro, or as the Italians say, chiaroscuro, a painting technique that creates soft gradients of light and dark on their skin and clothing to suggest volume in the use of a triangular composition to suggest balance and harmony, the painting shows a giant leap in representation from medieval art. Its timelessness shows clear references from the Greek and Roman art, but its style is definitely elevated to a whole new level. These styles and skills are seen across many Renaissance artworks that are timeless and beautiful to look at, a clear sign of economic and social prosperity. Art is finally reborn, after a dark period of cultural stagnation. Hence the term Renaissance, or Rebirth. Finally, the Baroque version. The triangular composition is kept, but there is more movement than the Renaissance counterpart. Diagonal implied lines are seen in the folds of Mary's clothing, 
Mary's torso and Christ's torso and limbs. Diagonal lines also make the work look more dynamic and gives a sense of movement, as though these characters are moving. Dramatic illumination and stronger shadows, known as tenebrism, are used to create more contrast, highlighting the characters and strengthening the implied lines, thus making the scene look more theatrical. The interaction between the mother and child is dynamic as well. Christ is caressing his mother's face, eyes interlocked to show a strong connection between the two. This painting displays a stronger emotional love that is somewhat absent in the Renaissance painting. This is simply a display of Mary and Christ. This one, however, evokes the strong bonds between the two. You can almost imagine Mary saying, I will protect you no matter what, just like any ordinary mother, while retaining its grandiose presentation. Like other Baroque artworks, art in this period were injected with emotions and drama through strong use of light and shadow and dynamic composition as they attempt to call more people back to Christianity, specifically by Catholic churches. Can you see the progression of style from figurative to figurative realism to figurative and emotional realism? Figurative Figurative realism Figurative and emotional realism Figurative Figurative realism Figurative and emotional realism Not everyone wanted to live in a Christian world. With the rise of scientific thought, the rage about the huge gap between the elites and the workers, and the rise of rebellions against religious authority and monarchy, art reflected more secular ideals. We can see this in the last two art styles of this segment of art history, neoclassicism and romanticism. Artists borrowed the styles of previous art movements, but elevated them to meet their current realities. Let's compare how both art styles depict a similar motif, a formidable authority on a horse. The person on the horse in this artwork is General Napoleon, who staged an uprising against the French government. This painting was commissioned by him, so clearly the artwork serves to highlight that he is a powerful leader. He sits in an upright posture despite sitting on his horse on hind legs. Chiaroscuro and atmospheric perspective is applied to the characters and the landscape, giving the whole scene a believable three-dimensionality. His stern face and his raised right arm mirror those found in Roman sculptures. The cape wrapped around his neck bellows in a dynamic and theatrical manner, adding grandiose to his figure, similar to the robes of the Greeks and Romans. The diagonal lines made by the horse parallels the diagonal landscape, giving an uplifting force, suggesting that only Napoleon can lead the army to the top, to victory. This is a rational man in control of his army, of his destiny, to be the most powerful person in his country. Neoclassical artworks draw the ideals of order, clarity, and morality from Greco-Roman culture, triggered by archaeological findings of Greek and Roman artifacts. Embracing these ideals are the artist's attempt to represent social and political events in a timeless, rational, and idealistic manner. It marks a new era of running the world, one less reliant on religious monarchy and more on rational thought. Romanticism art takes on a different approach in response to rebellions and spirit of nationalism. It advocates for people to be less reliant on authority and religion, and prioritize individuality, emotions, and imagination, to realize that we mere humans were never in control to begin with, when faced against primal nature. This romantic painting shares a similar motif as the neoclassical one, but wreaks terror and helplessness. The horse's back is facing the viewer, as though it is attempting to escape. The man's torso is turned, his head facing his back, his eyes looking down at an invisible enemy. His arm holding a sword is angled downwards, unlike Napoleon's confident upward gesture. Surrounding the equestrian character isn't a Grand Mountain's cape, but billowing smoke. The brushwork used is patchy, daubed, spontaneous, and not as well blended and idealistic. It creates swirling movement around the painting, adding more emotion, drama, and turmoil. The wreckage and fire in the background implies defeat and death, this is a man who is not in control of his destiny, despite his well-decorated authoritative uniform. He is not as powerful as he thought he was. This is man's true nature, a lone individual fearful of the unknown. Romanticism celebrates the individual emotions to be more superior than rationality. The art that you see here are dynamic and evokes strong emotions, and it aims to acknowledge that the world is a chaotic yet beautiful one. It is up to the individual to find our role on this planet and not merely become a sheep that follows the ideals set by some authority or religious figure. There is a clear dichotomy between the two art styles. One is more rational, idealistic, and orderly. 
while the other is more emotional, dramatic, and dynamic in nature. When you zoom out, you can see similar patterns across art styles. Here are the more figurative ones, the idealistic and realistic ones, and the more emotional ones. So if you ever find a contemporary artwork that shares similar characteristics with them, like this one, it'll be easier for you to draw connections between their art styles and analyze it better. This artwork seems to be inspired by the idealized art styles. Its white color reminds us of neoclassical or Renaissance sculptures whose artists assumed that the classical Greek sculptures were white, symbolizing purity and nobility, when they are in fact colored. He stands at a contrapposto pose, and he looks down his pregnant child like a mother would with hers. This artwork is perhaps drawing associations with the way the Greeks portray perfect ideal men and women. Is this pregnant man the ideal man, or the acceptable man of today's society? What makes a modern man a man? What are your thoughts? To sum up, these are some of the major art styles in the period before modern art. While the styles may be different, the subject matter in these art styles remain the same. Realistic depictions of mythology. History. Religion. People of power. And everyday people. These art often serve the elites and their taste, which even led to a new branch of art, academic art. This style is taught in art institutions that dictate what is good art and what is bad art. If you were ever scolded by your art teacher for not drawing properly or having bad shading, you can thank academic art for starting this dishabaggery. Some artists decided that enough is enough, and this was one of the factors that led to a new era of art. Modern Art Part 2, coming soon. If you'd like to be alerted of the next video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Happy Analyzing!